Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. Week 15, Book of Exodus, chapter 10, verse 1 through 13, 16. Uh, last week we were getting into the plagues of Egypt uh, prior to the Exodus and today we're going to pick right up with more plagues and the eventual Exodus, the command for the Passover and man there's so many parallels for what people call the second exodus or the gathering the regathering um so many parallels in the book of revelation just another action-packed torah portion are you ready i'm ready let's pray heavenly father yahweh most high we come before you lift you up and bless you and praise you our great king father and you sent your son, Messiah, Yahusha, the King of Kings. Father, we thank you for sending us our high priest, our Messiah, that he would die for us. And that all of us, we looked upon that cross and how Messiah was lifted up. That all those that look upon him might be saved and be brought back to you, Father, through atonement. Let us never forget that moment that we all had when we knew that, that was truth that he is truth and that you are truth and that you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you father we pray that our lives would be lives that would be called diligently seeking you father or represent diligently seeking you father and we pray that we can walk out the two greatest commandments loving you with everything that we have and loving our neighbor as ourselves knowing that your torah explains how to do that father we ask that you'd give us understanding, bless us, uh, that we may produce fruit that you desire from us, Father, and that eyes and ears would be open as we study your word and see uh, what was of old and the parallels and the foreshadows of what's to come. We love you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen and Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Right? Shabbat. I mean, some of you are watching this on Shabbat. Some of you are watching this in the future. But I just got to say, Abba Shabbat, favorite time of the week, is it not? It's a weekly appointment with him. It's a point, And it's an appointed time. And it's an appointment with our Father. And he says, and we're actually going to talk about this today. There's a there's a hand, only a handful of times in scriptures it says that certain things that we do he puts a sign upon us or a mark um the sabbath is one of them and as we'll find out tonight the passover is as well let's get into it so much to cover shofar Okay, here we are at Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to be reading from the Sefer version, which is uh, comes from the Masoretic text, much like the KJV and many other translations. We're going to be doing some parallel studies with uh, the Targums, which is the Aramaic translation, um, the book of Yashar, uh, mentioned in first, Second Samuel one eighteen, Joshua 10.13, uh, to really... Uh, expand this understanding of what's going on here in the book of Exodus. So here we go. <clears throat> Exodus 10, 1. And Yahweh said unto El Moshe, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, 
and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. And we talked a little bit about this last week, uh, explaining that Yahuwah simply hardened the designs of Pharaoh's evil heart already. He didn't like make Pharaoh, you know, do these things. That he just he hardened Pharaoh's already um, evil heart that was set on not letting the children of Israel go. He just strengthened what was already there, just like. Well, praise Yah that he would strengthen what's already in our heart, which is our desire to follow him, our desire to do what's right in his sight. But we're not going to get too far into the, today's Torah portion without uh, looking at some parallel scriptures. This is what I, I think I mentioned last week, but we didn't quite read it, um, about Paul quoting this or, or referencing Yah hardening his heart, hardening Pharaoh's heart. Let's read Romans 9, 17 through 22. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Thou wilt say unto me then, why do you find fault? Why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who are you that replies against Elohim? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if Elohim, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Right? He's long suffering even with these uh, vessels of uh, dishonor, like Pharaoh being a vessel of dishonor. Well, I can tell you. Um, I've been very open uh, in this ministry is that um, prior to coming back to him I was definitely a vessel of dishonor doing doing my own will doing what I wanted to do I had a hardened heart I had a evil darkened heart and only by his mercy did he reveal his son to me and many of us here watching that we could come back to him crawling praying Abba you know heal us forgive us forgive us through your son and his offering and in these last days, opening our eyes to his amazing truth that we are to serve him in spirit and truth. And uh, anyways, so, you know, thinking about how Yah made vessels of honor and dishonor in the world, you know, even more so, it gets even more specific about his own people, that his own people within his own called out assembly there's vessels, different vessels of honor and dishonor. Let's read about that. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy 2. Uh, very, very interesting passage here. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21. Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim stands sure. Having this seal, Yahweh knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Messiah depart from iniquity, which is lawlessness. Right? Depart, depart from, from transgressing the Torah. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, iniquity, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Praise be to God. Let that sink into your heart. Let's keep going. Exodus 2. And that you may tell in the ears of your son and of your son's son the things I have wrought in Mitzrayim and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know how that I am Yahuwah. This is something, you know, these stories, the, the Torah, the Exodus, the plagues, the, the Passover, this is something we're, we're supposed to continue passing down to our children. And we wonder, you know, we read the scriptures, we read, Torah, then Joshua and Judges. It's like right after Joshua died, you know, they're all serving idols. As soon as Moses goes up, you know, but if you read like the, the book of Judges and the book of Kings, you'll see that there's a righteous generation and then just the very next generation, unrighteous. You know, maybe a part of that was they weren't teaching their children diligently. And that's the promise in Deuteronomy 30 that at the end of dispersions, when we come back to him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and come back to his commandments, and teach our children with everything that we have, that then he's going to come and regather us. So, I'm asking myself, I'm asking you, are we teaching our children diligently? Are we showing our, our sons and daughters these things, right, of what Yahuwah has done for us, and his majesty, and how he created the heavens and the earth? Very important. Very important. Okay. Let's keep going. 
<clears throat> we're going to read uh, Exodus 10, 3 through 20 now. And Moshe and Aharon came unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says Yahweh Elohai of the Ivrim, the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locust into your coast. And they shall cover the face of the earth that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the remnant of that which is escaped, which remains unto you from the hail. And shall eat every tree which grows for you out of the field. And they shall fill your houses, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Mitzrim, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen, since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself, and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve Yahweh Know you not that, they admit that Mitzrayim is destroyed? He's like, Don't you know that Egypt is destroyed? <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, by the way, let me. Uh, sorry for jumping around here. I forgot to mention when we read in Exodus ten one about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. The Targum says something interesting. It says, "And Yahweh spake to Moshe, Go unto Pharaoh, for I have made strong the design of his heart, and the design of the heart of his servants to set these my signs among them." So the the Targum makes it really clear, uh, makes it a lot clearer that Yahweh hardened the already evil design of his heart. Let's keep going. So they're like, don't you know? Just let him go. Don't you know that Egypt is destroyed? Uh, verse 8. And Moshe and Aharon were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go serve Yahweh Lahaikam, but who are they that shall go? And Moshe said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto Yahuwah. And he said unto them, Let Yahuwah be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. He's like, you have, you have an evil plan. I can see this. Not so. Go now, you that are men, and serve Yahuwah, for that you did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Stretch out your hand over the land of Mitzrayim for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Mitzrayim and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail has left. And Moshe stretched forth his rod over the land of Mitzrayim, and Yahweh brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. And the locust went up over all the land of Mitzrayim and rested in all the coast of Mitzrayim. Very grievous were they. Before them there was no such locust as they, neither after them shall, shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Mitzrayim. Then Pharaoh called for Moshe and Aharon in haste, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh Lahaikam and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray you, my sin only, this once, and entreat Yahweh Lahaikam, that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahuwah. And Yahuwah turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locust and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Mitzrayim. But Yahuwah hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Yashrael go. You know, sometimes when we read, uh, we're such a visual generation. Uh, I say we because I'm included. Um... It's hard to imagine what that would actually be like, you know, this these, these locusts everywhere, because we really haven't experienced something like that. But I think maybe the closest thing to any of these plagues, maybe flies, I don't know about you, uh, um, years ago, I don't know what happened, but it was like an entire colony of flies invaded our house one year, and it was just so annoying. It was like... Um, this is before, this is a lot earlier in my walk before I tried to, <laughs> I, I don't like killing anything, you know, even spiders. I'm like, get in this cup, get in this jar if you know it's good for you so I can put you outside or else, you know. Even flies, I might try to like capture them and put them outside rather than kill them. Um, but even, but, but this was years ago and I was just like whack and kill, kill, kill. And they were just like, the more you kill them, like the more they multiplied. I'm like, I don't understand. And they were so annoying. They'd be like buzzing all over you. And I guess I can only imagine, you know, locusts just taking over, you know, the house or like frogs, all these plagues. But I mean, just how 
and they just and it wouldn't stop you know imagine imagine the the imagine what these egyptians were going through and also while we're you know while we're reading this remember this the israelites didn't have to go through any of these things um i don't know if you were with us on our uh, earlier stream with uh, the book of enoch but we were talking about it and you know in in this time they were protected in the land of goshen but in the future, um, it's uh, Psalm 27, in the future, when all this is going, all the destruction of the earth is going on, it says, this is 20, Psalm 27, 5, For in the time of trouble, he shall, so this is the time of tribulation, he shall hide me in his pavilion, which the, the Hebrew word here is sukkah, his tent. The tent that we read about in Isaiah 54, that once this tent comes down, her stakes never come up. This is New Jerusalem. He shall hide me in New Jerusalem. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. So when all this is going on, we're going to be hidden. Right? Uh, and then also in Isaiah 4. Um, and Isaiah 4, 5 and 6. And Yahweh will create upon every dwelling a place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies a cloud of smoke and by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night. This is this is future. For upon all the glory shall be a defense, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from the storm and for the rain. So in the time of Ex in the time of Exodus, they were protected um in Goshen. But in the future the time of revelation with the bowls and the pl and the and the vials and the and the trumpets, his people are going to be protected by New Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Alright, let's keep going. Um so let's take a look at uh so we read about the um locust. Now let's read uh Targum ten twenty, what does it say here? It says, But Yahweh strengthened the design of Pharaoh's heart and he would not release the children of Israel. Okay, so it's the same thing. It's just um, once again, so after the uh, locusts were, yeah. Let's read Yashar 80, 33 through 35. And Yahweh sent and brought numerous locusts into Egypt, the Chasel, the Salom, the Chargol, and the Chagole, locusts each of its kind, which devoured all that the hail had left remaining. Then the Egyptians rejoiced at the locust, although they consumed the produce of the field, and they caught them in abundance and salted them for food. John the Baptist ate them. They're clean. <laughs> if you were there with us at Sukkot, there seemed to be um, uh, roasted locusts and honey kind of just getting passed around. <laughs> and I ate it, and I want to be honest, it was actually pretty good. Like, it was good on your prayer. Like, ew, so gross. It was good. I was like, this is good. You know, even without the honey, it tasted like unsalted popcorn. So I imagine if we salted it, it probably would have been really good, like popcorn. <laughs> You're probably like, <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> they were good. And they're clean. They're edible. And Yahweh turned a mighty wind so the Egyptians were eating. They're like, ah, oh, they ate all our food, but hey, we're going to eat you. And Yahweh turned a mighty wind to the sea, which took away all the locusts, even those that were salted, and thrust them into the Red Sea. Not one locust remained within the boundaries of Egypt. So Yahweh was like, ah, I don't think so. Interesting. The Targums confirms this. Exodus ten nineteen. And Yahweh turned a wind from the west exceeding strength, and it carried away the locust and bared him into the Sea of Suf, there was not one locust left in all the borders of Mitzrayim, and even as such as had been salted in vessels for needed food, those two, the western wind, bear away, and they went. I need to add this to my notes here. I don't know why I didn't put that in here. 19 through 20. Okay. So let's uh, let's keep trucking along here. Oh, actually, we can't go too far. Revelation. We have locusts, a different kind of locust. Uh, and this has been a really interesting study. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence that points to this being um, the Joel II army, the army of Yah, especially like the crowns, um, the uh, the teeth like lions. Um, um, there's so many, 
we, we when we went through our Revelation 9 study uh, last year, year and a half ago, we made a lot of, par- we, we, we found a lot of parallels uh, of this being actually an army of Yah. But of course, there's there's lots of evidence that this is um, the army of the pit, you know. So um, it's not something that I really, um, you know, spend a lot of time on. It's just, it's interesting. But nevertheless, there's locusts and they torment men. Uh, Revelation 9, 1 through 11, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun of the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of Elohim in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. This is Joel 2 language. And on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And which, this is Micah 4 and uh, Micah 5 language here. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings as the sound of chariots, and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon, which the, the, Hebrew, t- the, Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew name Abaddon is not for a king, but it's for actually, the pit is actually called Abaddon. Um, so it, just interesting stuff. I, I, not a big point of contention for me. Um, this very well may be the, the army of the bottomless pit, but there's just a lot of interesting parallels to the end times army of Yahuwah in the same language that's used for his army uh, of Joel 2. Just kind of interesting. All right, um, let's go to back to Exodus 10. We're going to read verses 21 through 29, uh, the plague of darkness. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Stretch out your hand toward the heavens, that there may be darkness over the land of Mitzrayim, even darkness which may be felt. Any of, ever, any of you ever been in a situation like that? And Moshe stretched forth his hand toward the heavens, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Mitzrayim three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Yashrael had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moshe and said, Go ye, serve Yahuwah, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So it's like Pharaoh is like letting them go in phases, but like not all at once. He's like, yeah, I'll give you a little more than what you want. I'll give you a little more, but not everything you want. And Moshe said, You must give us also sacrifice and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto Yahuwah Lechenu. Our cattle also shall go with this. There shall not a hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve Yahuwah Lohenu, and we know not what we must serve Yahuwah until we come thither. But Yahuwah hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get you from me. Take heed to yourself. See my face no more. For in that day, you see, in the day that you see my face, you shall die. And Moshe said, You have spoken well. I will see your, your face again no more. So let's talk more about the darkness. Uh, we've got a little bit of that here, of course, in uh, Revelation, Revelation 16, 4 through 11. Uh, actually, I, really, I just wanted to read, um, yeah, verses 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the Elohim of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And this is the midst of all the plagues and chaos going on in the world, much like in Egypt, but in the end, in the end times, and they still don't repent and unharden our hearts. So people in the last days going through these torments uh, are like, they're all like little pharaohs. You know, in the last days, is this darkness literal? Maybe because it says the sun is darkened, the, the moon is darkened. But is there also a uh, spiritual um, uh, significance to it? I think so. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters and said, Let there be 
light. And there is light. We talked about this in Torah portion week one, just to review in case you haven't uh, seen all the uh, the Torah portions and are just kind of uh, jumping in here with us, is that we know that the sun and the moon and the stars were not created until day four. So this light is not like the light of the sun that we're, you know, we're used to, or the light of the moon or the light of the stars. This is a different type of light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. However, again, this is not night and day that we get from the sun and the moon. Paul had some insight here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-5, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahuwah, the day of the Lord, as they say, for so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. This is talking about spiritual darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, right? You're not, your, your eyes and your mind is not so blind and clouded that you can't see this day approaching. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. This is not talking about, you know... <clears throat> talking about the day and night that we're used to that we're you know when the sun's up it's daytime when the sun's down it's not it's nighttime you know um yah made daytime and nighttime this is i see this uh used in arguments for like the calendar and when the shabbat starts and ends and that's not what this is talking about at all uh, this is talking about a spiritual uh daytime and a spiritual darkness and let's talk about that here for a second isaiah 59 7 through 10 their feet run to evil this is talking about evil people they make haste and shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, lawlessness, wasting, destruction in their paths. The way of peace, right? The Torah they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. Because they're not walking according to the judgments and the commands of the Torah, they're walking in darkness, a spiritual darkness. Right? That's why he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Because if we're, if we're walking in his word, it's literally like walking in a pitch dark place with a bright lantern right in front of you. You're not going to trip. You're walking on that same path with pitch darkness, pitch dark, and you don't have that lamp. You're like you're probably you're walking probably really slowly and like uh, I can't see and you're like your feet are like uh, you know but if you have the light you're like <laughs> we wait for light but behold obscurity for brightness but we walk in darkness we grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes we stumble at noonday as in the right so they're just like ah I don't, where's the wall I mean have has, have, have any of you ever been in pitch darkness like a night where you're like. I don't want to trip. Uh, where's the wall? I don't want to run into it. You know, uh, that's what it's like to be walking without the truth of the Torah, without our Messiah guiding and leading us in spirit and truth, right? We're just it's darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet, my feet and light into my path. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law, the Torah, is light. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot, that there's keys that unlock other scriptures. And if you're ever wondering, you know, the parable of the, the wise and foolish virgins, they had lamps. You know, some had oil, some didn't. So, you know, some had light coming out of their lamps, some didn't. Here's your key to understand that parable. Isaiah eight thirteen through twenty two, sanctify Yahuwah Sebaot himself, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock offense to both the houses of Israel, for a jinn and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's why it also says in the Psalms, uh, that uh, uh, that many would stumble. Is it in the Psalms? Yeah. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law, the Torah, among my disciples. And I will wait upon Yahuwah that hides his face from the house of Yaakov, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahuwah Sebaot, which dwells in Mount Zion. 
And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their Elohim for the living to the dead? And I'm here to tell you that <clears throat> these people in mainstream media are these wizards that peep, right? When why would any of us seek after their wisdom? Should a people not seek unto their Elohim for the living to the dead? To Yahuwah and to the testimony. To the, I'm sorry, to Yahuwah. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through through it hardly, bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their Elohim and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. So all that to be read uh, about the future time in Revelation 16. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Probably literal and probably very figurative and spiritual in nature. So, <clears throat> now let's take a look at Yashar 80, 36 through 40. And, and now this is really interesting now. So, this has a lot of significance to the future as well. So here's the, the Yashar uh, version of the darkness plague. And Elohim sent darkness upon Egypt that the whole land of Egypt and Pathros became dark for three days so that a man could not see his hand when he lifted up to his mouth. Been there before. Wild. At that time died many of the people of Israel who had rebelled against Yahuwah and who had not hearkened to Moses and Nahron and believed not in them that Elohim had sent them. I'm here to tell you that a lot of Yahuwah's people are going to die in the end times that aren't hearkening to him, right? In the Torah of Moses, if you want to call it, it's really, it's Yahuwah's Torah that he gave to Moses, but it's, you know, the, the Torah of Moses as it's called, same thing's going to happen again. So it's saying here in those times that many of the people of Israel died that didn't hearken to uh, to Yahuwah and would not hearken to Moses, Nahron, and who had said, we will not go forth from Egypt, so their heart was hardened, lest we perish with hunger in a desolate wilderness, fearful, and who would not hearken to the voice of Moses. Just like it says, uh, blessed are those that keep his commandments. They have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the city through the gates. For outside, right, are the fearful and the and you know all the other things, the, the commandment breakers. <clears throat> and Yahweh plagued them in three days of darkness and the Israelites buried them in those days without the Egyptians knowing of them or rejoicing over them so the Egyptians were unaware that uh, Israel had to bury many of their dead that did not hearken and the darkness was very great in Egypt for three days and any person who was standing when the darkness came remained standing in this place and he that was sitting remained sitting and he that was lying continued lying in the same state and he that was walking remained sitting upon the ground in the same spot and this thing happened to all the Egyptians until the darkness had passed away. So, <clears throat> just like in the last days, there's going to be a great destruction on this earth and if we don't want to be part of that and die, with her plagues, Revelation 18.4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you would not receive of her plagues. So, come out of Egypt. Come out of her ways. Come out of her doctrine. Even the doctrine that attempts to serve him. I'm not judging people that do it wrong. I'm just saying, <clears throat> according to his word, Christmas, Easter, Sunday worship, these are all things that are her ways. These are all fornicating ways. These are all commandments of men that in Matthew 15 says that in vain people worship him, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So I'm not judging the people. I'm just saying that if we want to grow and we want to be on the right side of things when this all goes down, that we need to be following the king and his instructions and his orders and his map, his, his guidance, his rules, Just like a board game. If you want to win the board game, you don't follow somebody else's instructions. You follow the instructions of the board game if you want to win. Otherwise, it's no, you're a cheater. How much more his, I won't call it a game, but the, the test, the game of life. His life. I'm not talking about the game of life where you spin the thing. No. we got to follow his rules, his instructions. Or else, 
We're going to be partakers of her sins and her plagues. I don't want to be there. And I don't want you to be here. Be there. I want you to be here. I enjoy doing this with you. Hmm. Let's take a look at um, the Targums. 10, 22 through 23. Oops, that's not the Targums. And Moshe stretched out his hand toward the height of the heavens, and there was dark darkness in all the land of Mitzrayim three days. No man saw, saw his brother, and none arose from his place three days. But among all the sons of Israel there was light, that the wicked among them who died might be buried, and that the righteous might be occupied with the precepts of the Torah in their dwellings. Whew. Whew. Tell you what, the Targums are not perfect, but sometimes, ooh, hits it. Hits it hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Exodus 11. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Mitzrayim. Afterward he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor... This word borrow is more like take. And every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And this is the promise in Genesis 15 uh, that was given to Abraham. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And so that was the promise. And Yahuwah gave the people favor in the sight of the Mitzrayim. Moreover, the man Moshe was very great in the land of Mitzrayim, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And Moshe said, Thus says Yahuwah, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Mitzrayim. And all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Mitzrayim, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Yashrael shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that Yahuwah puts a difference between the Mitzrayim and Yashrael. And in the last days, he's going to do a separation of his people and the people of the world once again. He's going to hide us in his tabernacle while all this goes down. And all of these your servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get you out, and all the people that follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe and Aharon did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And Yahuwah hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Yahshua go out of his land. So, <clears throat> sorry. And Yahuwah, uh, so this part here, verse 9, it says, um, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Mitzrayim. And we see a little taste of this in Joshua 2 with Rahab. And this is when she's talking to the spies and said unto them, I know that Yahuwah has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how Yahuwah dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordans to Sihon and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we had heard of it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Yahuwah your Elohim, he is Elohim in the heavens above above and on the earth beneath and as we said last week and weeks previous that in the end times it says that the the, the end times gathering out of Egypt or Babylon or whatever you want to call it is going to be so much greater that nobody's going to be talking about this so all the nations will see this and will fear and will tremble because of the children of Israel and I want to be in that group that goes with him praise Yah alright let's keep going Oh, we finished 11. That's right. 11 is very short. Okay, now 12. Here's the big meaty part here. And Yahweh spoke unto El Moshe and to El Ahron in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Uh, what's interesting is we know that there's a lot of Jewish traditions that are added. And one of them is Rosh Hashanah 
being the new year being in the seventh month. So in the fall is when the Jews, modern day Jews celebrate uh, the beginning of the year. However, this month is the first month. This is uh, the first month comes March, April time frame. Um, the first month. That is Yahuwah's new year. Not the seventh month as the Jews traditionally teach it today. <clears throat> if that confuses you, um, if you're new, the Hebrew calendar is based off of the moon. Uh, as we see here in the book of Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus 43, 6 through 8, says, He made the moon also to serve in its season, to mark the times, and to be an everlasting sign. From the moon comes the sign for the feast days, a light that wanes when it has reached the full. The month is named for the moon, increasingly marvelously in its phases, an instrument of the host of on high, shining forth in the firmament of heaven. So, the moon is how we calculate the months, and since we that's how we calculate the months, that's also how we know uh, when to calculate the feast days. If you're curious about more about that, um, uh, I'd like to share um, our calendar series with you. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know why I'm so much clear in my throat. Let me uh, let me get here. Sorry. So, if you want to learn more, uh, this is the. The home page of Par okay. this is the home page of Parable of the Vineyard. Scroll down, and you'll see right here the calendar. This is the main study of how we understand uh, how the calendar operates according to the Torah and according to the Book of Enoch and Jubilees. Um, and then the next one over here is uh, how we understand a twenty-four hour day, uh, whether uh, Shabbat and feast days are an evening to evening or morning to morning study. So in any case, uh, here are some resources for you right here. And I just realized i got to update this right now. I'll do that after this study. I'm going to put a 2022 feast day calendar. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to the scriptures. All right, Exodus 12, 3. Speak you unto the assembly of Yashrael, saying, The tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbors next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole multitude of the assembly of Yashrael shall kill it in the evening. Obviously a major uh, prophecy of our Messiah. A lot of people um, <clears throat> kind of get confused here about um, when it's actually killed, when it's eaten. An interesting passage here, Jubilees 49.1. Remember the commandment which Yahweh commanded you concerning the Passover, that you should celebrate it in its season on the 14th of the first month, that you should kill it before it is evening, and that they should eat it by night on the evening of the, evening of the 15th from the time of the setting sun. So... Um, I don't even know why I brought that up. We talk more about that in the, the calendar series. We talk also about the um, the Passover study we did last year, which I'm also going to do a new version of for this year as well. Uh, way off topic. Let's keep going. But <clears throat> we know that Peter called our Messiah uh, a lamb without blemish. Uh, let's look at that. A lamb without spot. Peter. Was that Peter? First Peter 1.19. Yeah, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Messiah as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that's where we get this here, right? Your lamb should be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole multitude of the assembly of Yashrael shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night and roast it with fire and matzah, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his, ed, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And so, this is what Messiah talks about, you know, um, you know, where he says, he says, uh, 
uh, unless you eat my flesh and, and drink of my blood, um, you have no part in me. Uh, you don't have everlasting life. It's referring back to the Passover, but our Messiah is the true Passover, right? We do Passover now in remembrance of him, not that the blood of this the, the goat or the sheep uh, cleanses us or saves us. It's just remembrance. He says, do this in remembrance of me. But um, let's, let's go here. It says, um, nothing of it shall remain in the morning, right? And that's kind of why here we see in Matthew 28, 5 through 6. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear you not, for I know that you seek Yahushua, which is crucified, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where Yahuwah lay, where the master lays. So, <clears throat> just like in the, in the, nothing of the lamb was to remain in the morning, nothing of our true spotless lamb remained of the morning after he was crucified and buried. Praise Yah. He fulfilled uh, the Passover with perfection. But we know now the blood, his blood covers us. Instead of the doorpost of our house, it covers us symbolically. And praise be to Yah for his son, his his perfect land that he sent for us. Because without him, there'd be none of this. There'd be no Torah keeping. There would Nothing would be acceptable in Yah's sight. Uh, but only through uh, the blood of the lamb are we acceptable in his sight. Exodus 12, 11, And thus shall you eat it. This is how you shall eat the Passover, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Pesach. And I do eat the Pesach in haste with staff in hand because, you know, <clears throat> every single Passover moving forward, I'm going to be looking for him, for our, our lamb to return as the lion. And I want to be ready. I want, my, I want my bags to be packed, and I want to be ready. All right. For I will pass through the land of Mitzrayim this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast, and against all the Elohai of Mitzrayim, I will execute judgment. I am Yahuwah. <clears throat> and the blood shall be for you a mark upon the houses where you are. So here's one of the mentions of marks, right? So his blood is a mark for us. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the, bla the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations, just like the Sabbath, and you shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. And that's why we still do it today. We do it with a renewed understanding, knowing that this totally pointed to, to Messiah. This, this feast is all about pointing to him and his offering up for us. So how much even more shall we celebrate it? Paul says to do it, right? The guy that supposedly, people say, did away with the law. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Well, if the law is done away with, then there's no need to keep the feast. But it's not, of course. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth the torah praise ya praise ya praise ya exodus 12 15 seven days shall you eat matzah even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses for whosoever eats chametz leaven bread from the first day until the seventh day that soul shall be cut off from yashrael and in the first day there shall be a holy assembly and in the seventh day there shall be a holy assembly unto you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall guard the feast of matzah, unleavened bread, from this, for in this selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore ye shall you guard this, shamar, protect it, keep it, guard it, this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, ye shall eat matzah until the one and twentieth day of the month at evening seven days so <clears throat> he just told you right here exodus twelve eighteen, how to count seven days seven days shall there be no chametz found in your houses for whosoever eats that which is with chametz leaven even that soul shall be cut off from the assembly of yashrael whether he be a stranger or born in the land ye shall eat nothing with chametz with leaven in all your habitations shall you eat matzah again pointing towards <clears throat> Unleavened bread for two reasons. Number one, they had to leave in haste and they didn't have time to have it leavened. But really a, a true teaching behind this, pointing to our Messiah and his doctrine, 
John 6, 50-58. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. This is Messiah talking. If any man eat of this bread himself, his word, it's like we see in Isaiah 55, right? Why do you work for that which is not bread? His word is the true bread. He shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yahushua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He's pointing to himself as being the Passover. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, he's claiming himself to be the Passover lamb, but even more specifically, or more actually specifically the, the, the Passover lamb, but more uh, in a broad term, he's the Torah. And whoever eats of the Torah, because Torah is life, he that eats me, even he shall live by me. And that's quoting that's quoting Deuteronomy 30, verbatim about keeping keeping the Torah. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eats of this bread shall live forever. Matthew 16, 6, Then Yahushua said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And now we're getting to a spiritual significance of leaven. So when we keep the feast, which is coming up soon, by the way, um, if you're watching this close to the recording date, um, what are we, like two and a half months away? Yeah. Wow. And um, by the way, if you're interested in celebrating Passover with us, um, we're right at halfway f capacity right now. We have a capacity of 700. We have about 356 signed up right now. Um, if you're interested, I'll share with you at the end of this how you can sign up for Passover if you're interested. So anyways, back to the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. We learn what this actual level at leaven is. Matthew 16, 11 through 12. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning the bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So how much more when we're celebrating this week of unleavened bread that we purge the leaven, the doctrine of man away from us and walk a, a time to renew ourselves in the teaching of our Messiah which is in perfection of how to keep the Torah. Praise ya? Praise ya. All right, let's keep going. Exodus twelve twenty one. Then Moshe called for all the elders of Yashrael and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Pesach, the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door until his house until the morning. And this, I believe, does a Targum say that, that this was a command just for that time? Because some people try to do this now, and I believe that was just for that time. No, it doesn't say that here. But we know that this part cannot be kept because uh, when they went into the land, you know, they all left their houses and went to Jerusalem to do this. And they didn't have also have second homes in Jerusalem. A lot of, them, a lot of people were staying uh, at the at inns, you know, things like that. So this specific command not to leave your house was for that first Passover. After that, you know, I mean, they were, you know, um, when they went in the land, like I said, they was commanded they leave their houses to come down to Jerusalem to to keep it. So, anyways, just just some interesting things. Plus, also, uh, I don't think they put the blood on the side posts of their houses after that initial Passover, just like we don't do that today, right? <clears throat> For Yahweh will pass through to smite the Mitzrayim, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in into your houses to smite you. And ye shall guard this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. And it shall come to pass that when you are come to the land which Yahweh will give you according as he has promised, that ye shall guard this service. 
It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean you by this service? That you shall say, It is the sacrifice of Yahweh's Pesach, who passed over the houses of the children of Yashrael in Mitzrayim, when he smote the Mitzrayim and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Let me read the Targums here. Um... Okay. Well, because honestly, just reading this part, it sounds like he's telling us to put the blood on the doorposts throughout. So I kind of stand corrected um, of what the Torah actually reads. Let me read this again. I'll be the first to admit when I'm wrong about something. And you shall guard this thing for an ordinance to you and your sons forever. But what's interesting, what's tricky about this, again, is that, you know, uh, I'll be the first to admit, if, if I'm, I'm still learning, you know, I'm not sitting up here as someone that's got all the answers. Uh, I conduct these studies as if we were hanging out in my living room, you know, not some great teacher. Our great teacher is Messiah, and we're all just his disciples. Um, I, I do believe he's assigned me this role to help share some of the things that he's taught me. Um, but truly, our great teacher is Messiah, so I submit myself humbly before you that I may stand corrected that this is something that he didn't want the children of Israel doing with being the blood on the doorpost uh, moving forward, because that's what it seems to read like here. Um, so, uh, interesting. I'm, I'm not saying that we should put the blood on the doorpost now, um, but it's interesting that that's how it actually reads. Unless it's just talking about just the sacrifice of the lamb in general and eating it. But anyways, <clears throat> and the children of Yashorel went away and did as Yahweh commanded Moshe and Aharon, so did they. Verse 29, so the last, uh, last plague, <clears throat> the death of the firstborn. And it came to pass that at midnight, sorry. <coughs> And it came to pass that at midnight Yahuwah smote all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Mitzrayim, and there was a great cry in Mitzrayim, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moshe and Ahron by night, and said, Rise up, and get you forth from among my people, both you and the children of Yashrael, and go, serve Yahuwah, as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone. And the Mitzrayim were urgent upon the people, that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We all be dead men, or we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes and upon their shoulders. And the children of Yashrael did according to the word of Moshe, and they borrowed of the Mitzrayim jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Yahuwah gave the people favor in the sight of Mitzrayim, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Mitzrayim. And the children of Yashrael journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle, which is very interesting. This points right to uh, Revelation 7, uh, where you have the 144,000 that are numbered, and the only time we see people numbered is for war. And then right after they're numbered, you see the great multitude also standing before the throne. So very interesting language um, about repeating the Exodus for the last days of Revelation. So very, very interesting. <clears throat> and they baked matzah cakes, which is unleavened cakes. Uh, of They baked matzah cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Mitzrayim, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Mitzrayim and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Yashrael who dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan, they and their fathers was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of Yahuwah went out from the land of Mitzrayim. So it was literally to the day. Everything was planned, pre-planned to the day. Just like in the future, <clears throat> Revelation 9.15, And the four angels were loosed, that we also see in Revelation 7, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. They were picked for a specific time, the exact day. So it's not like 
the you know the rulers of this world are going to change when that day happens it's going to happen exactly how yahuwah planned nobody can deviate from that day that's that pre-planned day it is a night to be much observed unto Yahuwah for bringing them out from the land of Mitzrayim. This is the night of Yahuwah to be observed of all the children of Yashrael in their generations. This is a most holy day. Remembering how he took us up out of Egypt and in our time how Messiah took us spiritually out of Egypt and how he saved us and how he is our perfect lamb. So let us keep this feast with a completely renewed understanding pointing completely to our Messiah. Remember this. It says it's a night to be much observed. It's a big deal. Jeremiah 23, 7 through 8, Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, that they shall no more say, Yahuwah lives, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but Yahuwah lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries, whether I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. So the next one, <clears throat> what we're waiting for, much bigger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exodus 12, 43. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe and Aharon, this is the ordinance of the Pesach. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought from money, when you have circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. And all the assembly of Yashrael kept it. So we know not a bone broken, pointing to our Messiah. Psalm 34, 28 through 22, He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Yahweh redeems the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Hallelujah. Now here's the crucifixion, John 19, 30, 37. When Yahushua therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Not the Torah, right? But his offering. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, gave up the spirit. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Because right, it says it's supposed to be, and how it says it's supposed to be killed before it is evening. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahusha, they saw that he was dead already and they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he knew, I'm sorry, and he, and he that saw it bear record, and this record is true. And he knoweth that he said is true, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him who they pierced. Hallelujah. He is our lamb without a broken bone. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18-19 For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, for from your vain conversation received by, by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Whew. Think about this. Think about what the Catholic Church does today and how they have these things called like indulgences, right? Based off of your giving. <clears throat> Revelation 5, 6 through 13, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, the four creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, <clears throat> the four creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for you were slain and has redeemed us unto Elohim by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our Elohim kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And this brings up a point. 
you know, Messiah being our <clears throat> spotted lamb, or sorry, spotless lamb, our king, our high priest. You know, people ask the question, should we, you know, is Messiah to be worshipped? And I say, yes, I do. I know Messiah said, he taught us how to pray and we pray to the Father. However, I'm going to here to ask you this question. I think I asked this last year. You're meaning to tell me if Messiah appeared before you right now, you wouldn't drop to your knees and your head on the ground? I would. I would. And the book of Revelation says that he is worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. In David's day, people bowed down to him, an earthly king. How much more our Messiah, our eternal king, king of kings? I still believe our prayers are to be directed to the Father, just like Messiah taught us. Right? He said, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those that transgress against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So he taught us to pray to the Father, right? But I'm here to tell you, and I want to be honest with you, so if you think I'm totally way off and you're like, whoa, I don't want to listen to this guy anymore, I hear you. I'm not trying to shoo anybody off, but you should have a right to know how I feel and how I believe. And I'm here to say if Messiah were standing in front of me right now, I would bow down and worship him with everything I have. I believe that uh, in Joshua 5, is it, when the commander of the uh, the hosts of Yahuwah stood before him, which is basically the, the captain, the, the general, the, the great king of the army, I believe that was Messiah. Joshua had to take his shoes off because it was holy ground and worship before him, and he wasn't rebuked, not like a normal, not like a normal angel. Uh-uh. He didn't say, oh, get up. <clears throat> I believe it was Messiah that was in the burning bush talking to Moshe. Shoes off, holy ground. Just saying. Messiah is my king. I'll bow down before him and worship him. You have a right to know that. And um, without him, I'd be dead. I'd be a dead man right now without Messiah and what he did for me, for all of us. So absolutely, I'd be on my face worshiping the ground he walked on. John said, I'm not even worthy to unloose his shoe. You don't think that's somebody that we would bow down to? I would. Exodus 12:47. All the assembly of Yashrael shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with you and will keep the Pesach to Yahuwah, that all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near to keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. A lot of people ask me about this, and we know that the uh, <clears throat> the Brit Hadashah, the renewed uh, or New Testament, as they say, uh, is, has a lot of focus on the spiritual circumcision, which is major. Um... But uh, I also believe that circumcision is for today. And, uh, you know, like for the Passover uh, gathering that we're doing, uh, people that are uncircumcised may absolutely come and celebrate the feast and, and have a joyous time. However, we're asking those that are not circumcised physically just not to eat of the meal. Because that's what it says. I'm not going to keep him from feasting and, and staying with us and having a grand old time and, and celebrating Yah. But it says here very specifically, you're right. Uh, no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So if you're if you're thinking about coming, um, just wanted to put that out there. Exodus twelve forty nine. One Torah shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. Thus did all the children of Yisrael as Yahweh commanded Moshe and Aharon. So did they. And it came to pass in the self same day that Yahweh did bring the children of Yisrael out of the land of Mitzrayim by their armies. And once again, when he brings his people out. He's going to bring them out by their armies, as we mentioned earlier, with the 144,000 and the great multitude. Let's take a look at Jasher uh, 80. We're going to look at 41 through 81.5.
And the days of darkness passed away, and Yahuwah sent Moshe and Aharon to the children of Israel, saying, Celebrate your feast and make your Passover. For behold, I come in the midst of the night amongst all the Egyptians, and I will smite all their firstborn, from the firstborn of a man to the firstborn of a beast. And when I see your Passover, I will pass over you. And the children of Israel did according to all that Yahuwah had commanded Moshe and Aharon. Thus did they in the night. And it came to pass in the middle of that night that Yahuwah went forth in the midst of Egypt and smote all the firstborn of the Egyptians, from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of beast. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry throughout Egypt that night, for there was not a house in which there was not a corpse. Also the likeness of the firstborn of Egypt, which were carved in the walls of their houses, were destroyed and fell to the ground. Interesting study out there um, relating all the plagues of Egypt to um, to the gods of Egypt, the, the false gods of Egypt. Thanks, Hollis. Even the bones of their firstborn who had died before this and whom they had buried in their houses were raked up by the dogs of Egypt on that night and dragged before the Egyptians and cast before them. And all the Egyptians saw this evil which had suddenly come upon them, and all the Egyptians cried out with a loud voice. And all the families of Egypt wept upon that night, each man for his son and each man for his daughter, being the firstborn, and the tumult of Egypt was heard at a distance on that night. And Bathia, the daughter of Pharaoh, went forth with the king on that night to seek Moshe and Aharon in their houses. And they found them in their houses, eating and drinking and rejoicing with all Israel. And Bathia said to Moshe, Is this the reward for the good which I have done to you, who have reared you and stretched you out, and you have brought this evil upon me in my father's house? And Moshe said to her, Surely ten plagues did Yahuwah bring upon Egypt? Did any evil accrue to you from any of them? Did one of them affect you? And she said, No. And Moses said to her, Although you are the firstborn to your mother, you shall not surely die. You shall not die. And no evil shall reach you in the midst of Egypt. And she said, What advantage is it to me when I see the king, my brother, and all his household and his subjects in this evil, whose firstborn perish with all the firstborn of Egypt? And Moshe said to her, Surely your brother and his household and subjects, the families of Egypt, would not hearken to the words of Yahuwah. Therefore did this evil come upon them. And Pharaoh king of Egypt approached Moshe and Aharon and some of the children of Israel who were with them in that place, and he prayed to them, saying, Rise up and take your brethren, all the children of Israel who are on the land, with their sheep and oxen, and all belonging to them. They shall leave nothing remaining. Only pray for me, pray for me to Yahweh your Elohim. And Moshe said to Pharaoh, Behold, though you are your mother's firstborn, yet fear not, for you will not die. For Yahuwah has commanded that you shall live, in order to show you his great might and strong stretched out arm. And Pharaoh ordered the children of Israel to be sent away, and all the Egyptians strengthened themselves to send them, for they said, We are all perishing. And all the Egyptians sent the Israelites forth with great riches, sheep and oxen and precious things, according to the oath of Yahuwah between him and our father Abraham, which we read in Genesis 15. And the children of Israel delayed going forth at night, and when the Egyptians came to them to bring them out, they said to them, Are we thieves that you should go forth at night? And the children of Israel asked of the Egyptians vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments, and the children of Israel stripped the Egyptians. And Moses hastened and rose up and went to the river of Egypt and brought up from thence the coffin of Yosef and took it with him. And the children of Israel also brought up each man his father's coffin with him and each man the coffins of his tribe. 81. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot beside the little ones and their wives. Also a mixed multitude went up with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in the land of Egypt in hard labor was 210 years. So this was just the time they dwelt in, 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 in Egypt. This is not in contradiction to what the Torah says, that they uh, dwelt in Canaan and Egypt to uh, 430 years. This is just Egypt in hard labor was 210 years. At the end of 210 years, Yahuwah brought forth the children of Israel from Egypt with a strong hand. And the children of Israel traveled from Egypt and from Goshen and from Ramesses and encamped in Sukkot on the 15th day of the first month. So, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's see. About the Passover in general. Luke 22, 19, he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given to you for you do this in remembrance of me so we could take that uh, as just the passover every time we do the passover we should do it in remembrance of him or every time literally you're breaking bread or eating in remembrance of him i don't know now <clears throat> messiah is the center point and key to all of this 
He is the Elohim of the Hebrews. The covenant has always been through the to the Father through Messiah, our mediator. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide, live in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. Which is very true, like you take a, a grapevine, you break off a branch and set it, you know, set it to the side. Can it bring forth grapes anymore? Well, no, of course, it's broken off. So he's, even, he's saying, even like this, if you are apart from me, you're not going to bring forth the fruit that the Father wants, and you're going to be cast away and thrown into the fire. <clears throat> I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If we keep my commandments... You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Even in this world full of tribulations and tests, still being able to, to have joy and praise him in the midst of the fire. That is that is true patience. Let's take a look at the Targums. 12.2 <clears throat> uh, Uh, yeah, this month is ordained to you to be the beginning of the months, and from it you shall begin to number the festivals and times and cycles. It shall be to you the first of the number of the months of the year. Verse 6, And it shall be bound and reserved for you until the fourteenth day of this month, that you may know that you may not know the fear of the Mitzrayim when they see it, and you shall kill him in according to the right to all the congregation of Israel between the sons. Interesting. Verse 8, and you shall eat the flesh on that night, the 15th of Nisan, until the dividing of the night, roasted with fire, without leaven, with whorehound and lettuce shall you eat it. Bitter herbs. 13. And the blood of the paschal oblation, the Passover, like the matter of the circumcision, shall be a bale, right? Like everybody knows, like bale bond, you know, get you out of jail. Shall be a bale for you to become a sign upon the houses where you dwell. And I will look upon the worth of the blood and will spare you. And the angel of death, to whom it is given power to destroy, shall have no dominion over you in the slaughter of the Mitzrayim. Uh, what else do we have here? Let's see here. All right. <clears throat> uh, 43. And Yahweh said to Moshe and Aharon, this is the right of the Pasha. Every son of Yashar who apostizes it shall not eat of it. It's kind of interesting. Very interesting. Um, all right, so let's finish up uh, with 13. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Yashrael, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moshe said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand Yahweh brought you out from this place. There shall no chametz, eleven bread, be eaten. This day came ye out of the month Abib. And by the way, this has been an interesting topic of discussion too because Jewish custom is that you throw everything out of your house um, that has, um, you know, um, even like baking soda in it, which I used to do, but I don't do that anymore. Um, even even things that have yeast in it, like, you know, think about wine. Well, wine is part of the Passover. Um, wine has yeast in it, you know? Uh, so some people go as far as to like, throwing away their all their you know beers all their uh wine and just i think it's literally talking about just leavened bread like people that had like sourdough star you know balls that you know, keep going i think we toss those out 
sorry. Yeah, I think it's just you start over you know, every year. Maybe it's healthy to do that, you know, to not have a sourdough ball going for years. I don't know. But uh, Zach Bauer, um, Zach Bauer has a good study on this. Just type in Zach Bauer um, uh, leaven or unleavened or what is leaven or something like that. It's a really good study. <clears throat> this day came you out in the month of Ib, and it shall be when Yahweh shall bring you into the land of the Kenanim and the Chitim and the Amorim and the Chivim and the Yebusim, which he swore unto your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days shall you eat matzah, unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahuwah. Matzah shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no chametz be seen with you. Neither shall be the le leaven seen with you in all your quarters. And ye shall show your son on that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahuwah did unto me when I came forth out of Mitzrayim. And it shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand, and for a memorial between your eyes, that Yahuwah's Torah may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand has Yahuwah brought you out of Mitzrayim. And this is, this is a major point. You know, uh, we saw earlier um, that the blood of the lamb would be a mark or an, a sign. The Hebrew word is ot, sign or mark upon the doorpost of your house. And we obviously relate that to the, the blood of Messiah being marked upon us. We also see that keeping this, fe this, this feast day in general is literally a sign on our hand and our forehead. Uh, very reminiscent, of course, to Revelation 13, talking about the mark of the beast. Everybody focuses on the mark of the beast so much, right? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the, the mark, right? And it says that the receive the mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Let me ask you, do you think it's just pure coincidence that the mark of, the markings of Yahuwah are on the hand and the forehead, and the mark of the beast also happens to be in the hand of the forehead? This is why I think there's so much symbology as, a, as opposed to a physical, you know, thing like, um, you know, the jab they're putting in everyone's arm that saying you can't, you know, go shop at, you know, Wally Mart unless you have that. I don't think that's what the book of Revelation is talking about. Um, namely also because, well, if you have more questions about that, um, we have a study, oh, also on this um, homepage, I think it's this playlist here yeah right here this is the video right here it's called the v the future the mark and the hidden deception uh go way in depth in that so if you haven't seen that and you're curious about my totally my stance on the mark what it is what it isn't uh spoiler alert i think everything has to actually do with having the mark of yeah or the absence of it so <clears throat> we see messiah's blood being a mark we see the, the Passover and unleavened bread being a mark. Ezekiel 9, we see that those that weep and sigh for the abominations done in the land are marked. Uh, and we see in Deuteronomy 6 that people that keep the commandments in general, that when they do that, it's a sign on their hand and their forehead. We also see that uh, the Sabbath in Ezekiel 20 and Exodus 31, that the Sabbath itself, that when you keep it, it's a sign, the same Hebrew word, mark, uh, between him and his people. So I think all those things combined is the mark not the sabbath alone not the not the passover alone um not uh you know all of that together is the mark of yah and i believe that's what we should be focusing on you shall therefore regard this ordinance in his appointed time from year to year and it shall be when yahuwah shall bring you into the land of the kenanim as he swore unto you unto your fathers and shall give it you that you shall set apart unto yahuwah all that open the womb and every firstling that comes of a beast which you have the male shall be yahuwah's and every firstling of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb and if you will not redeem it then you shall break his neck and all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem. And it shall be that when your son asks you in time, come, saying, What is this? That you shall say unto him, By strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us out from Mitzrayim, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahuwah slew all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahuwah all that opens the womb, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a mark upon your hand and for frontlets between your eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us forth out of Mitzrayim. Praise Yah. <clears throat> and I forgot to mention here also what's really in interesting is that uh, for a lot of people, one of the first steps they do is the Sabbath and the feast days. And what's interesting about this fe feast day in general, it says again in verse 9, It shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes that... 
So if you do this, your reward is that Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth. Action, reward. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. So, uh, one more thing um, I wanted to share with you. Talking about the regathering in Jeremiah 31.8, it says, this is the Masoretic, this is the KJV, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind, the lame, the woman with child, and her that travails with child together, a great company shall return here. So this is the great regathering. However, when we took it, we, this is the Masoretic, when we take a look at the Septuagint, which is much older text, this is the Greek version. In the Greek version, Jeremiah 30, well, this is a little confusing, sorry, but Jeremiah 31 in the Septuagint is actually Jeremiah 38. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 38, 8, or Jeremiah 31, 8 in the Septuagint. Uh, it says, Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of Passover, and the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return here. Whoa. It seems like the day of Passover is the day that we're waiting for the regathering and the great feast. So that's why I said earlier, every single Passover from the rest of my life, I'm going to be looking for that day with great anticipa anticipation. Praise yeah. So with that said, brothers and sisters, uh, is the end of our Torah portion. Uh, a couple things I want to cover. I actually want to show you... Um, <clears throat> I want to show you uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, as far as if you want to sign up for the Passover, uh, again, you just go to the homepage, but you go to the, any of the Torah portions. Uh, let's click on this one. So all you got to do is go to the See More section right here. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Huh. Sorry. The Show More section right here. And you'll see here... Pesach in Lebanon, Missouri, sign up. Just click on that. And you'll see here's the sign up information. And here are some of the frequently asked questions and some of the rules. Um, what's going on, the dates, all that kind of stuff. Which, uh, by the way, is... Uh, let's see. Do I have it on here? The gate? Oh, Yeah. We will be camping from April 15th in the morning check-in to April 24th check-out. It's a 285-acre private campground nestled in the, on the Niangoa River. It's high ground above the river. So those of you that uh, know about our story last Passover with the uh, interesting time, uh, we are very elevated from the river this time. Uh, there's room for 700 people, but we are going to cap it at 700 just so we can it can be manageable. Um all the RV camper sites are already they are full in like 10 minutes but people can uh, can boondock if you have a camper or RV uh, you can boondock um, the cost including the Pesach dinner uh, will be 75 per adult and 30 per child for the whole duration of the event so it's 8 days of camping and the Passover meal uh, 75 per adult and 30 per child so uh, for the whole time for the whole eight days of camping so that covers all your camping costs uh, and covers uh, that's going to help us cover like the tent and um, all the food for that meal um, all the activities uh, things like that so uh, anyway so if you're interested here's the registration form again uh, you can find that here in the uh, the see more section of right here like my sound effects. All right. So with that being said, let's pray, brothers and sisters. And um, yeah, it's good starting with you. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you, bless you, praise you in Yahushua's name. Thank you for your spotless lamb that you sent for us, Father, that, that we may believe, that we may uh, eat of his flesh and drink his blood spiritually, of course, um, and that by him we are reconciled and saved, Father, and that we are to walk as he walked and according to his perfect teaching. Father, we uplift you, we praise you, we honor you, we thank you for all that you do for us, and may you continue to guide us in your path towards your kingdom, Father. We wait uh, earnestly for your kingdom, Father, and for the return uh, of our Lamb as the Lion of Yehuda. We love you and bless you, and Father, we praise you for all you do, and we, and we thank you, Yahusha, for the amazing things you've done to us and for guiding us bless you and say Shabbat Shalom to you. Amen and Hallelujah. Yahuwah.
Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. I uh, pray this is a blessing for you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Do a couple songs. Uh, we'll do a couple songs on the way out. So let's do the priestly blessing and a song of Boshe. I sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my ale, and I praise him. Elohim of my Father And I exalt Him Yahuwah is a man of battle Yahuwah is His name He has cast Pharaoh's chariots And his army into the sea and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You 
sent forth your wrath It consumes them like stubble And with the wind of your nostrils The waters were heaped up The floods stood like a wall The depths became stiff In the heart of the sea the enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil, my being is satisfied on them. I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who like you, oh, Yahuwah, among the mighty ones, who is like you, great in Kodesha, awesome in praises, working wonders, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them, in your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan melted. Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, O oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. In the place, O oh, Yahuwah, which you have made for your own dwelling. The meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah which your hands have prepared. Yahweh reigns forever and ever.